Um, good morning to, uh, to Stefan, who also joined us. Um, maybe we should do a, a very short uh, introduction round for the attendees to, uh, to see uh, who we are and what we do, uh, because we have some new people here in the uh, in this session, so I think it's interesting to, uh, to do. So, um, Harm, do you want to start? Yes, of course. Good morning, all. Uh, my name is uh, Harm Mulder. I'm the operation fleet manager of the J Shipping Group. Uh, the owner, Jaraya, is also uh, logged in. Um, and yeah, uh, responsible for the, for the fleet of JR and uh, ship, uh, CZIP. Uh, and to mention that we are also uh, 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 yeah, involved with, with, with autonomous shipping, in which we did uh, uh, an industry project last year with the CZIP 3. And also investigating uh, and following the, the innovat innovative uh, autonomous projects at the moment, uh, which we will discuss later on. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Jan Reijer? Yeah, my name is uh, Jan Reijer Arends, owner of the uh, JA Shipping Group, uh, where CSIP is uh, a part of and uh, mostly doing business development and all kind of commercial stuff. Thank you. Rainier? Hey, good morning, guys. I'm uh, Rainier. I'm working for the NNPC, which is uh, the Dutch uh, based uh, PI club. Uh, we're based um, in the north of the, of, of the Netherlands for almost 85 years. And uh, since three weeks, we have opened also an office in uh, the Rotterdam area, where, which I recently joined. Um, so we yeah, as a club, we very, very steadily would like to expand uh, our business. And also the topic, of course, of autonomous sailing uh, is very interesting also from an insurance point of view. So I'm glad that I can uh, join for today. Thank you, uh, Rainier. And Kerry? Yeah, good morning. Kerry Forster from the Workboat Association. Um, pretty much gave my introduction already. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. James. Yeah, hi, good morning. Um, I'm from a company called L3 Harris. Um, we were formerly known as Autonomous Surface Vehicles based in Portchester in, uh, in the UK. Um, so yeah, we, we basically design, build and operate vessels, autonomous vessels ranging from sort of between three to 13 meters. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, uh, I'm one of the uh, maritime operations coordinators for them. And James, I missed your company name. For, from which company? Uh, so we were formerly known as Autonomous Surface Vehicles, uh, but we were, we were taken over by a company called L3 Harris. Um, so we're now known as L3 Harris ASV. Okay. Thank you, uh, James. Taras. We still can't hear you, unfortunately. I think there's no audio connection with Taras. No? Okay. Well, let's, um, let's move to James. Taras, if you, we can hear you, then, then please jump in uh, afterwards. So James, if you want to introduce yourself. Uh, you're muted, James. Uh, just to just to let you know, James is also from uh, L3 oh. Harris. Oh. <laughs> he's the he's the sales manager at, at L3 Harris. Oh. Um, so he he probably he'll probably be sorting something out, but he'll be with us, I'm sure. Oh, okay, that's fine. Thanks, uh, James. So we have the two Jameses from L3 Harris. Then thanks. <laughs> um, so Ketchum, please. Uh, uh, thank you, Frank. Uh, Gertjen Huizink, founder of the Lisa community, a place where we connect companies, maritime professionals who are active in the design, building, operations and management of ships, everything that floats at sea. And if you are to succeed in our industry, you need other people, even autonomous ships need other people for the process. So we connect them via these kind of events, but also within company groups where we share our knowledge and experiences. Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you, John. So, um, yeah, uh, good morning. My, uh, my name is uh, Frank Rellou. Uh, I work for Sea Machines uh, Robotics. And um, um, yeah, thanks for joining this, uh, this event. Um, yeah, a short introduction of, of what we do uh, to, to move into this event. Sea uh, Machines is uh, selling and producing uh, and implementing standardized uh, class approved autonomous command systems on commercial vessels. And today I would like to have a discussion with you on how you look at adding automation to the bridge, assisting the crew uh, to make better and safer decisions. Because uh, if we have uh, learned and know, one thing is that we are humans are very good in doing a lot of things, such as uh, edge cases, but we are not that good in repetitive routine operations, such as transits and so on. So of course we get fatigued and distracted and this is causing lots of accidents and something uh, in our opinion a computer is better um, or is not bothered with let's say so just before we start i would like to highlight uh, one thing is that um, the phrase autonomy is often confused with remote control as we see a lot so um, the key difference as we see autonomy means that the vessel is able to uh, to take its own decisions and remote control means that an operator sits behind um, some joysticks while steering the vessel remotely. So we apply both as sea machines and would like to add that autonomy in our book also is not synonym to, uh, to unmanned. I think that's also important to mention. Um, so from the systems we have deployed currently on the water, uh, these uh, autonomous systems are used with an operator in the loop. Uh, and if, uh, um, um, and if and when we will ever reach unmanned autonomous systems uh, or vessels, uh, that's a question uh, we don't know, but we see already the value um, today. Good morning, Leo. Uh, thanks for joining. Um, so let's let's uh, uh, discuss further what what the topic is about. Uh, so um, Harm, uh, since you have done some testing uh, with CZIP already, as you mentioned uh, on on CTV vessels. Um, what was the operational, what is the operational added value you see adding autonomy to the crew transfer vessel? Yeah, and uh, to, um, to explain in, in short, in, in the short way, uh, what we did, uh, we have uh, CTV vessels, crew catamaran vessels operating mainly in North Sea and the German Bight and England. Uh, and we did last year, we did in the joint industry project an autonomous test with, with, with the system, with the module, in order to find out uh, uh, if how, how the ship behaves with the autonomous sailing. And that means we did some test trials at sea. It was the first seagoing vessel which ever did, did an autonomous test at sea, a real, real time. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, we, we did this test and we uh, made our conclusions. We did evaluations with, uh, with the companies and the customers and ourselves and yeah, our added value anyway was that yeah, as a company we started uh, with zero knowledge of autonomous shipping that we started with what is what is autonomous shipping anyway uh, till now that we yeah, gained a lot of knowledge and also see some added value in the future. It, it, it's a long way uh, but there's certainly added value and we see it uh, not to relieve, for example, crew members on board, but to assist the crew members on board and not, not to replace, sorry, I, I mean replace. So it's not in order to replace the crew, but to relieve the crew and assist the crew in, uh, let's say, navigational waters. Yeah. If I give, can give you an example, for example, um, oh yeah, this is this is already an industry in autonomous shipping. I think that's the survey aspect. If you have a survey vessel, then uh, an autonomous uh, module and autonomous shipping is really handy to carry out and quite simple to, to, um, to, to operate. Uh, but besides the survey aspect, it's also, it could also be of, uh, of useful and uh, valuable. For example, if you have a crew transfer to a windmill park, uh, let's say 30 miles off coast and you see the, uh, the, the ship is sailing 24 hours 
and this captain is steering the vessel and he always sits in his in his chair that's 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 what he needs to do he needs to navigate and he does not come out of this chair 12 hours um, and he uh, sails the he, he, he operates the ship from the port to the windmill park and this is one track and this this track could easily be done by uh, an autonomous module uh, in order to relieve the captain a little bit of this navigational watch and the steering uh, to sit all the time in this chair 12 hours so it, th that's that's one example which could be valuable for uh, for the for the captains um, besides that uh, uh, yeah the the computer is always safer than, uh, than, than steering by, by personnel. And the human factor is eliminated with, uh, with, with autonomous shipping. That does not mean that it, it needs to develop uh, also in a certain way, huh? uh, uh, let's say the efficient, uh, efficiency, but in, 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 if you look at the safety of uh, autonomous shipping, yeah, it, it, it is safer than, uh, than uh, uh, nowadays. It, oh. it is a safer, uh, safer operation. Thank you. Uh, yeah, this, these are uh, just examples uh, where we see some uh, valuable, uh, yeah, uh, operations and valuable uh, uh, integration of the autonomous uh, shipping. Yeah. Thanks. Um, Renia, how do you look at these comments as, as harm given uh, from your insurance point of view? Well, first of all, the, the interesting part is that, let's say, current arrangements of insurance, uh, whether it's well, machinery or crew insurances or p and insurance, my background, uh, can, f can fully cater for this kind of uh, operation. Uh, because uh, for the insurances, it is essential that, the, that there is a crew element which remains on board, which also says well there is a, for instance if there is a collision that it's clear that there is still a captain <laughs> who is responsible overall uh, who, co who has a collision with another vessel uh, and still the normal rules of the ball rack traffic control uh, regulations but also the emo um, regulations can fully um, comply for so for an insurance point of view and for our members point of view it can be very interesting to have this, if I may say, kind of autopilot on board, which can really prove um, that it can, for instance, uh, reduce um, possible claims. So from an insurance point of view, this is an interesting one that you have the system on board, but you also have still the crew on board. Um, so yeah, for us, we can easily adopt, I think, um, it is interesting from, from a claims point of view, and in the end, yeah, also for our members, uh, from a premium point of view, because if the claims reduce, it's good news also for the owners in terms of uh, premium for insurances. So I find it positive um, and for us easy to, to adapt and, and provide the same service as usual. Yeah. Do you see then, for instance, also that um, there is a possibility to, um, to let's say, reduce the, um, um, uh, the cost for insurance, let's say, there with? Is that an opportunity that you already see? Uh, well, yeah. yeah. I think if uh, with insurances, we always look back. Yeah? So we look at what happened the last four or five years in terms of claims. Uh, but if we, as an industry, start doing this more and more, yeah, it may result in less uh, in less claims, and less claims may result in yeah less cost for insurance. Yeah, uh, the only some kind of a problem with our industry that we always want to walk in in a way behind innovation, eh? like like some kind of a span of control. Um, so for us, it's difficult, for instance, to say upfront. We got all these systems in place, eh? so, so owners are very much investing in, in these systems and that we already upfront say, well, okay, this is going to be brilliant. Eh? It's got already will have an effect on your cost. So there will be some kind of an overlapping time eh? from an owner's point of view that you are 
and he's investing in these uh, technology. And at the same hand, it doesn't necessarily on the same day also says that you are reducing your cost on insurances or other services that you need as a vessel. Yeah. So yeah. you will need, of course, some time to uh, to get it proven, let's say, before you can actually yeah. uh, reduce costs. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, true. Yeah. 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 Okay. And um, James Royston, I guess, um, uh, you already use uh, fully unmanned systems uh, on, on your vessels, I on, on, on your systems, vessels, I should say, because you provide both. Um, how do you deal with these kind of, of uh, things we sketched, you know, that you need to have seafarers on board and ins uh, insurance-wise? How is that covered with your systems? Yeah, it's, um, so we, we have, um, sort of like you were saying, we, I completely agree with there's a, a remote side uh, and there's a, a fully autonomous side. And actually a fully autonomous side is something that is, is quite advanced. Um, we do have the capability... Um, of some of our vessels that have that. So what, what might include that is we have collision avoidance. So some of our uh, features uh, on board allow the vessel to actually comply with the coal regs. Um, we have obstacle avoidance. So we have sort of short range radars and stuff that can pick up buoys or for our case, because we use them uh, a little bit more close to the shore. Um, it could be uh, a kayak or a swimmer or something that's in the water that we we, we would like the obviously the, the vessel to avoid and um, the geofencing um ability as well so we can actually corner off areas that that we think are dangerous as it's transiting through a um a passage or some sort of um nav navigable water um and and we tried to use as much situational awareness as possible so we've got 360 cameras um, day and night cameras and it just allows the operator to have as much information as possible um, to get the vessel through um, potentially quite a hazardous area. Um, we, most of our vessels that are, so we have fully unmanned vessels that have no, nobody on whatsoever and we also have sort of a, a semi-autonomous um, class if you like so you can have people on board to operate and you can then remove those people and have the, the vessel in a fully autonomous state um, with nobody on board. So we we kind of, our, our vessels are coded um, through usually the workboat code and we use a company called Mikau uh, to survey our vessels. Um, so we have to sort of comply with, with certain regulations when we're building and then when we're actually operating as well, um, which is quite important for us, especially if there are uh, you know, if it is a manned vessel and there are people on board, we need to obviously make sure that they're safe. Um, so, yeah, so from my point of view, I think another point someone made about uh, the, the surveying side uh, and, and still having that need for people to, to be on board vessels, we kind of see it as that we're just adding a force multiplier. So you would still need the, the crew on board, let's say a mothership, but we, we can sort of offer extra vessels to complete the work in a shorter period of time gathering extra data and and sort of ultimately the the, the job would be done quicker and more efficiently so you still need all the post-processing work to go on and uh, and all the extra extra bits on board the mother vessel so yes yeah, certainly we're not trying to take away jobs from people actually you argue that we're trying to uh, create jobs by having these operators on board to to watch keep um, the vessels when they're actually operating. Um, it's quite interesting as well. To, uh, to use unmanned vessels already, let's say, are you already using them completely unmanned? And, and how do you deal then with the regulations on that and insurance? Do you get exemptions or how does that work? Yeah, so for some for some sort of cases, we, we work very closely with the MCA. Um, so for a couple of operations that we've had to do in the past the MCA, MCA have actually stated that we need extra certification and they'd like to see uh, extra documentation uh, like you were saying the insurance side of it and and also they'd like to see a demonstration of how the vessel is actually going to operate in that scenario so they they want to understand and actually see how how this is actually going to happen for them to for them to give us for example, we've had to get a load line exemption for one of our 13 meter vessels. Um, and, and that was one of the requirements from the MCA. 
Okay. I asked James what 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 kind of vessel it is, a 30 meter, and what what operation kind of operation does it uh, do? So we've got a, a range of vessels. We we predominantly work within the sort of military industry, the commercial industry, and the science and survey industries. Um, so the 13 meter that we were actually um, using uh, for this to, to gain a load line exemption was we were trying to prove that we could cross the the English Channel. Now, there were obviously blockages that France, let's say, didn't want an autonomous vessel coming within their waters. And we tried to go through the process to, to enable it to happen. What we would like to have done was driven it into a port in France, moored it alongside, had people there, berthed it and then returned the following day. But due to, <clears throat> due to some reasons, we weren't allowed to do that. So actually, we turned the vessel around around the 13 mile sort of mark. So we weren't breaking into the French waters as such, turned around and came back. And the idea of this was to prove to the customer that it could cross a fairly busy, you know, the English Channel, fairly busy channel autonomously using obstacle avoidance and collision avoidance. Um, so we, we, we had that, we did that. We, we were basically demonstrating this to the customer. And this was for a military, uh, a military vessel. So effectively, this would be used potentially as a patrol vessel for harbours. It could be used as a force multiplier uh, on an operation. Um, there's, there's quite a lot of uses for these. But, but yeah, so for instance, a survey vessel could be exactly the same reasoning. If, if we're asking to survey a part of the part of water that could be hazardous or we need extra um, extra certification, let's say, to be able to, to work in that area, we would also then need to ask the governing bodies, say, are you happy for us to do this? This is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to achieve this. And these are the safety regulations that we've put in place to, to be able to do that. Yeah. Sort of we find that there's a lot of communication. That there has to be a lot of communication with, with local port authorities, with, with, with all these sort of shipping authorities. And we find that if we've got a good working relationship with them, generally they get on board with us quite quite easily so it's it's definitely a positive yeah well thanks uh, James uh, Kerry you were raising your hand as well yeah just to say that there has been one movement that is quite well known between flag states so far of an autonomous vessel between the UK and Belgium um that the other issue is is of course because we're we're testing regulation one of the, the ways to get through the gateway is to use domestic regulation where the stakeholders are much smaller and so therefore regulation can be adapted and exemptions can be made to allow autonomous shipping to take place in a controlled manner um, but with domestic regulation most of us are aware it comes down to a gentlemanly agreement between flag states whether or not they honor each other's domestic regulations in their waters so as James was saying it, it really comes down to a close communication between flag states uh, and between yourself as a third party. Um, governments aren't allowed to directly discuss with each other gentlemanly agreements because any agreement becomes official if it's intergovernmental. Um, so the, the use of third parties can really help this. Um, this is something that I get involved with a lot, acting a third party between two governments. And one government tells me one thing and I tell the to the next government and I pass the message back and that can still remain a gentlemanly agreement but as soon as they talk to each other it becomes official yeah. and if it becomes official most, most gov governments want lawyers involved um, yeah. and if you want insurance to be covered most insurers want to make sure there's been some lawyer agreement so it, it is hard um, so just backing up what James says there but I, I think more could be achieved if we were to especially around the North Sea area as a test bed for these vessels, work on uh, an inter, um, like inter-country agreement. So if there's an organisation in the Netherlands, for example, and an organisation in the UK looking after autonomous shipping, they have the contact of each other and they talk to their, to their own governments and flag states. And with, under that agreement, then I think we've got um, a good market for autonomous shipping yeah. it, it won't happen directly unfortunately no no i agree and it's a it's it's a growing process yeah correct do you have already in your organization um 
people that are looking not necessarily to full autonomous, as we said, because we are focusing more at the moment on pilot assist or what have you. So more um, adding basically an additional set of eyes to the crew on board, assisting the crew, making better and, and smarter decisions, basically. So from that perspective, is there from your organization already people that look at these kind of solutions or talk about it or? Yeah, very many. And, and also, also on an industry scale, um, if I give one example, offshore wind, because a lot of people understand it well here. Um, anyone that knows the sector knows that we are asking vessels and crews to go work in an area of dangerous navigation. Um, we spend our life as seafarers avoiding collisions, but in the wind farm industry, we're asking people to make controlled collisions every day. Um, we, we put people into areas, not so much these days, but in the past of shallow waters. We have additional voyage, which is put in the area to, to help navigation of other ships. Um, we put vessels in, in the middle of wind farms with lots of known targets. And if we think about the targets that we have in those projects, many of them are known to us before we even leave the harbour. We know where the wrecks are, we know where the shallows are, we know where the wind turbines and the buoys are. We know if there's exclusion zones from construction activities, we know if there's divers in the water. Um, at the moment, there is no artificial intelligence which stops the CTVs or any other vessels which are working on the farm from hitting any of those obstacles or each other. And we still currently rely on the operator's use of uh, navigational instruments um, to use them correctly for collision avoidance and also for obviously their own audible and visual uh, means. But I think artificial intelligence working within this sector and other sectors such as dredging, where we have moving spoil grounds, et cetera, and pipelines, um, will be a pathway to the future to avoid collisions from known targets. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that. Um, Leo, um, you're also in, in, in this industry. Uh, maybe you can do a short introduction while joining a bit later and, and tell us how you look at um, adding this additional kind of uh, technology to crew transfer vessels, for instance. Yeah, sure, Frank. Sorry for being late. Um, yeah, I'm Leo Hambro. I'm Commercial Director of Tidal Transit. Tidal Transit is a crew transfer vessel operator, primarily in the offshore wind sector. Um, and uh, we have an interest in uh, the system or a system similar to this. Um, partly, uh, well, I guess primarily uh, at the moment to focus on uh, collision avoidance. Um, after some of the incidents that have happened in this industry. Um, and as part of that collision avoidance, in the reduction of fatigue uh, on the crews that are involved in the operations. Um, so, and, and obviously it will be wonderful to, uh, to plan towards a world where um, we can, uh, where the master of the vessel can be simply in charge of the system rather than necessarily in charge of the vessel, but I think we're obviously clearly a long way from there. But we look at the system like this as, as effectively as an, as an enhanced autopilot. Uh, the autopilot that we have on board the boat doesn't know anything about its surrounding. It just knows where it's been told to go to. Um, uh, and we think that this uh, system with the, uh, with, the, with the inputs from the radar, from the echo sounder, from the AIS, uh, and, and any other uh, sensor um, would allow the, uh, the, 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 the master to be more, made more aware of his surrounding and for the computer to make potentially, as, as, as was mentioned before, better decisions than our, than our masters could make in terms of uh, the ways that they react. Yeah, thanks uh, Leo for sharing uh, your insight in this as, as an operator. Um, Jan Rijer, as an owner of, um, of JR Shipping and CZIP, of course, what, what did this um, test you have done um, had for an impact for your company in exposure or? Yeah, first of all, we got a lot of attention, uh, of course, because uh, we did the test uh, with a big uh, group of companies where there was many uh, involved. Uh, so we got uh, gained a lot of attention. Um, and it said, well, it's more or less what uh, Leo uh, said. It, it's, uh, the, we had some, uh, some terrible accidents uh, in offshore wind uh, business uh, in the last three years uh, with, with, with some huge uh, collisions. 
uh, both with uh, turbines and and, uh, and 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 other vessels. Uh, so it's, uh, I think, uh, it's it's perfect uh, tool for uh, a collision avoidance, um, and 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 we work also in uh, in uh, in the survey uh, industry uh, more and more, and 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 there is really huge development uh, um, going on uh, uh, for all kinds of survey f vessels, uh, manned and uh, unmanned. Yeah, so that that uh, yeah that I think we're still in the early stage and uh, and there's a lot of opportunities and uh, where you can use this uh, uh, new technology uh, for. Yeah, thank uh, thank you, uh, Jan Raya. Um, Hassan, you you um, I think you also have customers within this uh, offshore wind, offshore energy, uh, oil and gas. Um, do you also recognize this need from your customer end, or how do you look at, uh, at this new technology? I think a new technology is uh, not much tested in that region. Uh, however, um, I don't have a very thorough knowledge about that uh, situation, but uh, it requires also a good investigation that I will carry out from after this meeting, which, which was extremely useful and educative for me. Okay, okay. Thank you for sharing, uh, Hassan. Um, so, um, Fordip, we have not heard you. Can you uh, also add something to this discussion and then where are you from? Can you hear us? Fordip? Ah, you're muted. Sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry, sorry for no that. Uh, sorry for running a little bit late for the meeting. I was in uh, another meeting previously. Uh, I didn't see the video, but we've been in contact with you concerning the, your collision avoidance system. And this is a very uh, cutting edge technology. And we are, we are actively uh, engaging and discussing with you uh, because this, uh, this system actually uh, respond some of the needs that we're facing now in the industry. So um, I'm here to learn a little, little bit more. Yeah, great. Yeah, and you say that, yeah, yeah, we, of course, we have already spoken uh, to each other. Um, the fact that you, can you explain a bit more about the reason why you reached out uh, to see machines to begin with? What was the, the background uh, or let's say the driver of investigating this, this new technology? I guess the drivers will always be to make the, the operations more safe for technicians. And uh, now we've been awarded uh, some uh, CTV contracts and we are being pushed by the, by the clients to have systems that will enable us to make the operation safer for their technicians. So uh, this, is the, this is the factor the motivation that lead us to uh, to learn more and to to be aware that these systems exist and they are the future. Yeah. Well, and and for the, what's the company? Good morning. What's the company you're working for? I uh, can get Louis, that. Louis Dreyfus Armateurs. It's a okay. French. Uh, Louis Dreyfus. And Dreyfus. Okay, of course. Right. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I, I think it's fair to say this This is related to what uh, Tidal Transit and Louis Drapers are doing together with regards to CTVs, specifically yeah. in France, so the clients that we are working with, and you know, what we're being asked for uh, to, to, to enhance the safety of the technicians that we're carrying. Um, but as a, but the, the, the clients that we're working from have, unfortunately, the experience of incidents in the past few years where people have been hurt. Collisions. Yeah. Thanks for uh, for adding that, uh, Leo. So, um, yeah. Um, in general, uh, let's say, uh, what what are the expectations uh, um, adding this automation part to the CTV, uh, um, Renato? What what uh, what are your expectations from the company? Uh, from C machine side. 
No, adding this, uh, yeah, adding the 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 automation, uh, this, uh, our yeah. uh, system to to the CTV. What what is the expectation? Yeah, the expectation would be to fully um, to fully make sure that the collisions will be avoided, uh, since our the operators had had uh, the uh, some events in the past. So it will be to respond their needs and. We've been in this discussion with Leo. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, oh, thanks. Yeah. Was that also uh, something, Harab, that, that was uh, one of the drivers at uh, at CZIP end? Or? I beg your pardon? No, I was asking to Harem, uh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but okay. I, I was asking to, uh, to Harem if this was also one of their drivers to uh, investigate this uh, this new technology. Yeah, and I would, uh, the, uh, I'll, I'll, yeah, more or less, yes. Uh, uh, the drive was also to, to, um, yeah, to, 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 um, to follow the innovations, of course, as a company, and to see where the opportunities are for the future um, uh, in in CTV market, but not only limited to CTV, but you see also development on on general cargo vessels, of course, with autonomous shipping. Uh, and uh, another project where we uh, where we involved in is, uh, for example, autonomous guard vessels. Uh, so the the autonomy is will will be a part of uh, of of uh, the innovations for the future, and we see it as a as an addition, as a relief and uh, assistance for the crew. That that's what we see. We don't see, I think, uh, on short term that, uh, for example, CTV will do an autonomous uh, boat landing on wind turbines or offshore vessels, but mainly for the transit times, uh, it, would be, it would be of added value. Yeah. Uh, and so the driver is to, 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 um, yeah, to, stay, uh, to stay in the, in the innovations and to, uh, to, to be involved in it yeah. in order to, uh, to, to, to use it uh, in the future. Yeah. What, what? How do, I have a question, if I may, on, on how the system responds on possible hazards. Yeah, so you have a transit, uh, the crew is put it on autopilot, um, is doing other stuff, uh, and then it appears that a possible well, collision or got a, a grounding yeah, somehow out of route and uh, it potentially heading on, on the sandbank. Uh, Harm or Frank, how does that work? Is there an a alarm bell? Is there a is there a signal to the crew, or is is the, the vessel dealing it with itself? Uh, how far yeah. are we? Yeah, well, that, that's a good question, uh, Renier. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, the thing is that um, as we um, use the autonomous system, we we use it as a system. Uh, that's why we call it autonomous, since the the system uh, in the vessel in that point is able to uh, to respond on its own making its own decisions. So as soon as you, um, let's say, activate a, um, a so-called mission, uh, you go from A to B to C to what have you, then um, the vessel will sail that, that transit and then in the meanwhile, observe his, uh, his surroundings. Um, the surroundings are, of course, uh, can be uh, land mass, it can be marine life, it can be buoys, it can be vessels, that can be different kind of uh, objects. Um, but it also takes into account um, uh, what's below the boat. Uh, so the depth sounder is also taken into account as well as the, um, the chart you plan the mission upon. So with the system, you get a user interface where you plan a mission upon, and that's basically running on an uh, electronic uh, navigational chart, an ENC. So you will already see there the depth contours and, and this kind of information and setting the threshold of your vessel, it doesn't allow you to save a mission, for instance, when you try to run over shallow water, for instance, to begin with. So that's already a savior. Um, so then when you are active uh, sailing the boat and there is something um, that is going to approach you, and that can be uh, a moving mass like a vessel or it can be uh, something else, it will be detected and it will be responded upon accordingly doesn't mean necessarily that we are going to deviate immediately as we see something. That's not the thing. But since it has a CPA of the uh, uh, approaching object uh, um, and also taking heading and speed into account, 
it can decide you know what it needs to be do to avoid the uh, any collision that can be very uh, um, let's say following the coal racks in basic uh, so it will follow the coal racks avoiding that object but it can lead to deviate from the course it can be to throttle down simply you know to take some uh, some gas down to to slow down the boat um, but in all circumstances, the system is programmed in such a way that it will avoid at any, any means possible. So if the other vessel is not responding according to the regulations, then it might even happen that your vessel turns around and sails the other direction just to avoid a collision. So it's actively uh, taking decisions um, and not just sound. Of course, it's notifying the crew that collision avoidance is active. So as a crew member or as a captain, you will see that something is happening. Um, and you will see also what's happening, of course, uh, but the system will take action itself. And again, to avoid that if the captain is fatigued or if he doesn't see what's going around, uh, then the vessel will always take action uh, itself. And you, of course, can override such. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So but the, there is some kind of a notification to the crew building. Yeah. Absolutely. In adverse situation. Okay. Because yeah. that is that is uh, crucial to to insurances eh? because then in a way it remains a, a similar operation eh? that that uh, still if something tends to go wrong that somebody of the crew is also being notified and can also okay. look together with the system or overrule the system uh, yeah. and that is important in um, yeah today's insurances and and and, and call racks i guess yeah yeah okay Correct. yeah Thanks. Can um, I ask, in addition to this, eh, uh, you explained the autonomous, uh, um, the autonomous functioning. Uh, James mentioned, uh, this question to James, you mentioned that you also had uh, added visual cameras. And is it also included in already in the autonomous module? Um, so what we're working on at the moment um, is to be able to have uh, quite a high powerful, powerful camera that can pick up images and that we store a library of images on board the vessel and it can actually detect and see, okay, this is a sailing vessel, this is a, a ferry, and we can sort of amalgamate that into the sort of what we call a risk landscape picture. So it's like we use already, as, as we've already said, we use AIS radar, um, and we can use sort of images as well to be able to add that into sort of a, an extra piece of information for the vessel to understand. Yeah. And then what the way we then operate is very similar, I guess, to uh, Frank is we, we create a risk landscape um, and it shows the vessel's route to where it needs to go. And then if it's going to deviate, you'll see an alarm pop up and you'll see a separate route starting to be formed by the vessel. And that's the route it would like to take to avoid a collision. Um, if, it, if it isn't going to, so if, if the vessel isn't going to, well, the other vessel isn't going to avoid us because we're complying with the coal regs, we've got a, a last response engine that would kick in and we can set that parameter so that we don't approach within 100, 200, 300 meters of a vessel. Uh, depending on the area that you're, that you're operating in. So, um, yeah, we, we try and use as much situational awareness to, yeah. to help and assist the vessel make its decisions. Yeah. Well, it was a good, uh, good question, Harm. And, and yeah, we are implementing camera as a sensor as well. Yeah. That, yeah. Uh, as as uh, James said, we also use radar AIS to detect um, mm. in, uh, at the moment. And a camera will be added as an additional sensor so that you can discriminate what is actually the target that you're going to approach. Meaning that yeah. for the moment, we treat every object as a power-driven vessel, meaning that our coal racks are also according to such. But if you add a camera um, uh, as a sensor, then you can also discriminate, you know, uh, what kind of vessel is it? And then maybe change your um, behavior uh, to collision avoidance as well. And of course, detect other objects that you might uh, not see on radar or AIS. Yeah. Um, Frank, can I ask a question as well? I'm please. Sure please. Sure. Uh, I hear a lot of uh, benefits and uh, possibilities. That's great. Um, in order to make this mainstream and, and, and really phasing in into the industry, 
in what area are the current challenges the highest? Are that the technical ones? And this is a question for the audience at a whole. The technical ones, is that the legal and insurance part? Is that the commercial side or the financial side? Or is that the operational side to get it actually embedded within the organization? Or is it just the awareness side of people still unable to grasp what it actually is and before they trust these kind of systems? So, so in what area are the current challenges to make this a reality a little bit more? Yeah, I'll leave it first to the group to, to reply, maybe. Yeah, and uh, from operational side, of course, this is also a challenge. You need to integrate it in, the, in, 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 the, in, the, in your uh, current management uh, uh, and, 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 and operational staff and team. Uh, this is not something what you can do in one week or one year uh, that, that needs time and you, you, you need to think differently. Yeah, that that autonomous uh, will uh, will control a vessel, and you have al always override, but you don't do it remote, and you don't have control. But it, it's taken over control. But it's definitely if you operate more vessels, then you uh, operate more efficiently when you uh, uh, deal with autonomous shipping. Uh, and uh, yeah, but that's that that is a challenge, and uh, I think. The, the other challenge is legislation, I think, and, and maybe Rainier can uh, comment to that. Yeah, it, uh, thanks, Han. Uh, I think the challenges are on all, <laughs> all markets that you mentioned, Schetjan, as always with, uh, with, with innovation. Um, I think from, from the insurance point of view, what, what, we, what I said also in the beginning, uh, as long as there is uh, the crew is on board that's a fundamental difference for insurances if it's 100 percent remote uh, and autonomous i'm sorry without crew uh, we run into the current boundaries of um, of legislation and emo and and call racks and and the likes if it is a combination um, then from a, i think from a legal and insurance point of view there are possibilities to explore. And I think, James, the examples that you gave like 20 minutes ago, that it's 100% autonomous, were really bounded projects yeah, that the local uh, authorities agreed. Yeah, that we all know the example of Norway, of course, uh, that, that you mentioned that the, the, uh, the autonomous ride um, uh, between the UK and Belgium, I think, uh, what was this? Uh, they they uh, were ex exporting oysters or something like that. But it was a small. I think the vessel was called Sea Kit, and they made a, they made a, a passage from the UK to Belgium. But this was all really bounded in a project where everybody said, "Okay, let's go and um, let's make it work." Uh, so I think if it's a combination of technology with crew, from insurance point of view, you can speed up. Uh, if it's really autonomous, um, yeah, then you run into the disaster <laughs> of international shipping rules uh, because you can even guess, even if we have it organized in Northern Europe, uh, what if a vessel from Africa or the States comes in, uh, how does it work? Are we going to make a zone uh, like the low silver zone at the moment in Europe? Well, we all know that that took like maybe 15 years to get it organized from a legal point of view. So again, I like the simplicity of having the technology and the crew both on board, and maybe that's the fastest way forward. And, and, uh, and maybe add to that, uh, Rainier, kijk, uh, also the challenge in a technical way is of course uh, also to improve the systems. Eh? Uh, and that's why it's always good to have the crew on board because uh, 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 there are seafarers beyond you, I think. Eh? There are so many situations at sea uh, which seafarers anticipate, for example, in navigation. Yeah. Uh, a, a computer does, uh, has some difficulties with the uh, anticipation of uh, situational awareness at yeah. sea. And that, is, that, that, uh, that needs continuous improvement. And that's why it's so important that the crew is also on board to, to, to share, yeah, to, 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 uh, to take advantage of the knowledge there is in such situations in order to improve uh, continuously the systems. Yeah, and also in a way, how possibly that the crew is training the systems on yeah. how to behave. And 
give some kind of a yeah. validation to the system, like, okay, this is indeed, uh, what we just saw is indeed a vessel. <laughs> or, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, it was a boy. Uh, yeah. So it, 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 having the both systems in place can also, I think, I believe, help making the IE systems better because you said the essential knowledge of the crew can be included. So Yeah, yeah. and that is one, one thing, what's, uh, yeah, and then I quit uh, Frank. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I, that's one thing that's that's nice to to to, to tell. Huh? We we did the test, and uh, all the our captains were also on board. Of course, we asked them, "No, please join the test." And say, "What is this test? It's autonomous shipping." Oh, what is this? It's so so I I will get fired. <laughs> now I say, we, "We need you for your knowledge." Yeah, and uh, but after all, they they uh, they they were aware that they are. Uh, of significant importance in order to improve this autonomous yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, shipping. Thank you. Yeah. I agree. And it's, uh, of course, it's uh, uh, fair to say, I guess, um, that, yeah, as soon as you start, start talking about automation, and this has been seen in the normal industry as well, of course, the first fear is that you lose your job. But I guess, as, as both of you said, you know, the human is really good in, in edge cases and these kind of, of different uh, scenarios. Um, um, yeah, a human is much better than a computer in that. That's that's very clear. And that's, I guess, also why we will see, for instance, uh, you know, autonomous cars uh, on driving on a highway pretty soon, but driving them through the city of Amsterdam will take uh, <laughs> a bit longer than that, you know, because that's so different and so so much variables there that that the computer is not that good in but the computer is very good in in the standard transits you know in the uh, things that we are humans not so good in so i think and that's where we believe the added value is in that is is that having them both you know it is going to um, support one another that's that's the case how we see it and again if we go some point to full autonomous uh, uh, container transits uh, i don't know you know, uh, I think nobody knows, but uh, that's not an, an, a goal or an aim on its own. We see already added value as you see on the systems you have in your car currently. And also as you see in, 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 in airplanes, for instance, but also this kind of automation is used in, uh, uh, in warehousing. You see it everywhere. So we believe that um, the marine industry is basically next to bring up this uh, part of automizing and uh, yeah, helping the crew, uh, making it safer. So we have two minutes left. Um, anybody right else? To, could I just make a point on that as well? Just sure. to answer your questions. Um, yeah, so a challenge certainly for, from going from a, a semi-autonomous to autonomous state that, that we see sometimes is you've got, if you're depending on the transit distance to your wind farm, the comms link from, from what would be now your ground station where you're operating from to the vessel in the wind farm, uh, that would have to be uh, fairly robust and be able to achieve those ranges, obviously, to, to, to get your vessel there. And also to, to have uh, a very <coughs> sufficient e-stop system that, that can stop your vessel immediately uh, with no delays. Uh, and what we're trying to achieve is a, a SIL rated e-stop so that like for insurance purposes and, and safety cases and risk assessments, we've got this assurance behind us that this this e stop has been designed to this level, uh, and it should it should keep some people happy and smiling. But it's mainly to keep the people on board safe. Hmm. Thanks, James. All right. Anybody else that would like to add something or? Yeah. 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 No, sorry, I need to go to the oh. next meeting. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's also good. All the best, uh, guys. Good to see you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for joining us. Okay. All right. Then I think. Now, uh, yeah, Frank, you Frank, you used the uh, the example you used at the end. I think as lo as soon as the autonomous cars can uh, learn to yield uh, at uh, each other's and uh, learn bad words, they can drive in Amsterdam. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, seriously, I think the question of liability and uh, legal implications of fully autonomous uh, ships uh, also need to be addressed. 
uh, in parallel with other aspects. It's not just technical. Also, there are aspects of, uh, it is the same thing for everything. You know, if you are going, last week also, we had the same situation with drones and uh, this discussion also uh, centered on that area as well, that, you know, we, with the advance of technology and, uh, you know, using autonomous uh, un, um, unmanned uh, vehicles, also we are entering into a field of, you know, legal aspects of that and liability issues, which need to be addressed also alongside with the other uh, advance of technology and uh, increased use of this technology. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Asan, for uh, sharing that. Okay, guys. Uh, well, thanks for uh, for joining. If you... Um, yeah, uh, think that we have enough more to discuss about this, then uh, please let me know. Then we can uh, maybe create an additional event. I'm more than happy to talk more about autonomy and, and technical aspects. So, uh, yeah, please um, uh, join me. And I think you already done in, uh, in the group on Lisa. And let me know, you know, I'm more than happy to create another uh, event talking about uh, autonomy and technology regulations, what have you. So thanks for now. Mark, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, thank you so much. Thank, thank you very thank you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you all. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye, bye. bye Frank. Ich bleibe fragen, Frank noch. Ja, ist gut, oder?